professor of philosophy at the Southeastern Louisiana University. He is a Deleuze scholar and expert in many other fields of post-structuralism and Nietzsche's thought. His most relevant books are Philosophy at the Edge of Chaos, Gilles Deleuze and the Philosophy of Difference, the Problem of Difference, Phenomenology and Post-Structuralism, and first one, I think, Deleuze, Hume. Uh, he is, it is forthcoming mm -hmm. uh, beyond the analytical continental divide. Oh, that's been out, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> the title of his talk is End Times, Deleuze, Percy and Pragmatism, and inorganic life. So it perfectly responds to the goals of our seminar. And uh, I'm very glad he's here today. Please. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to, to be here and uh, look forward to the discussion. And uh, um, I'm going to open up with a little bit of context, and that's I'll use sort of a PowerPoint to kind of help in that process. And then I'll do the reading part. Um, just want to let you guys know a little bit about the work that I'm doing. Um, even looks like he's good. Okay. Perfect. I'm just use the. <laughs> Okay, thank you. All right, um, one of the things, when I came up with this title, End Times, I was thinking of, I had a, a puzzle that I've been thinking about. I had a conversation with a friend and we'd been talking about capitalist realism. Some of you may be familiar with capitalist realism and uh, Mark Fisher's book and, and, and so on. Very popular book. And he has a famous line in that book that uh, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Um, and I, I'm not an expert on Mark Fisher, but, but I, I found that an interesting yet true statement and and so one of the things i was thinking about is why is that such a true statement today that it's easier to imagine the end of the world and with all the stuff going on in the world these days it's even easier perhaps to imagine uh the, the, the end of the world um rather than the, than the end of capitalism and i have some some ideas that I'm working on. That's kind of brings me to the project that I'm working on now. And uh, the project that I'm working on now is basically uh, an extension of my previous works so or the works that are about to come out. And tentatively, it's called Making Sense of Philosophy is the project right now. And, and the main thing that I'm looking at is the principle of sufficient reason concept or idea of that principle as it has played itself out in modern philosophy. And I have done some of that in um, two books that are coming out in September. Uh, first of the two books is an inquiry into analytic continental metaphysics, truth, relevance, and reality. And in that book, I develop a metaphysics of problems in a sort of Deleuzean vein. And I use a sort of Deleuzean uh, metaphysics of problems to address some key problems in metaphysics. The problem of the new, the problem of the one and the many, the problem of emergence. Um, and um, those be kind of go back and forth between analytic and continental traditions. And the principle of sufficient reason kind of looms pretty large in that, that work. Um, the other book that's coming out, it's kind of, it initially started as one two volume work, but then when the publisher got a hold of it, they were like, well, for marketing purposes, you probably should have two different titles. Uh, so they kind of were birthed together, but uh, have now come to be sort of separated by titles. So you can see in the subtitle, they have a similar subtitles. So it's somewhat kept the shared birth. Uh, the second one's towards a critical existentialism. 
And in that book, I'm developing a theory of narrative that I use as a way of, of providing for a political critique. And that brings me back to the problem about the end of capitalism and some of the things that are going on. And so, so one of my ideas is that there is a sort of narrative at play that makes it so hard for us to think about anything other than the current situation. And so some of the tools I develop in both those books is um, helps in that regard. And, and one, of the thing, one of the ideas that I think is at play is a sort of organic model of thought. It goes back to Hegel and the Hegelian tradition. I think that's one of the, the, the model. And, and nationalism, I think, feeds off of this sort of organic model. Because I think nations and nationalism is another one of those things that is really hard to imagine being other than that. And if you look historically, we've been much more creative with our social life than we have been over the last few hundred years in terms of entering in, into new social relations. But now nationalism has really become it's, it's, I would say it's just as hard to think about getting rid of nationalism as it is to get rid of capitalism. And I would say that's not a coincidence. Um, so one of the things that I was thinking of as I approached this paper is that if the organic model of thought is part of what's at play in the current thinking about nationalism and capitalism and politics and other areas, then maybe in the concept of inorganic life that you see in Deleuze, there's a way of breaking out of that sort of organic circle. And I think that can also be found in Peirce as well. And so that kind of becomes the topic for today. So that's, so the, that's the broader project of what I'm doing, what I'm thinking about. And uh, the more focused project or paper for today is going to be um, to lose in person where inorganic life might come into play. So there's basically five parts to this paper, short parts. Um, it's only like 13 pages once I start reading it. Uh, the first part is the skeptical challenge. I, I, I see a lot of modern philosophy as being in some way a response to the skeptical challenge that Sextus Empiricus and, and so on kind of brought to the surface Rene Descartes most famously addressed it with meditations, but, but others as well in, in the modern tradition. So I, I do think skepticism plays a core role in the history of modern philosophy. So I'm gonna look at Peirce's role in that. Principle of sufficient reason in Peirce, the, as I said, part of my larger project is how principle of sufficient reason plays throughout modern philosophy. So today I'll focus on how Peirce uh, uses that concept, how, it, how it's important for him. And then I'll bring in, for reasons I'll explain in my talk, Spinoza, because I think Spinoza is an important figure with respect to thinking about rationalism and laws of nature. But I offer a different reading of Spinoza, a Deleuzian, surprise, surprise, a Deleuzian reading of Spinoza that I think uh, helps bring Peirce and Deleuze together, which is what I do then. Oh, I think I clicked the wrong button. There we go. Sorry about that. That brings me to the Deleuze section of my talk where I'll talk about contemplation, habit, and inorganic life. Sharing the screen. Okay, accepting the, the sharing. Um, Okay. Okay. So did that at yeah. So then we'll talk about the Deleuze contemplation habit in organic life. That kind of gets to the crux of the argument today. And then I kind of wrap up bringing curse back in and the skeptical challenge and see where that, that leaves us. Okay. Sextus Empiricus's text, Outlines of Pyrrhonism, would provide the early modern tradition with a number of important skeptical arguments. The most important argument for our purposes is the one, as Sextus Empiricus puts it, based upon regress ad infinitum, whereby we assert that the thing adduced as a proof of the matter proposed needs a further proof, 
And this again, another, and so on ad infinitum, so that the consequence is suspension as we possess no starting point for our argument. And what has come to be called the problem of, the, of criterion, the problem is that if we need an idea or standard other than the idea we hold to be clear and distinct in order to justify the truth of this idea, then what is the idea or standard that justifies this idea or standard? And so on ad infinitum, right? What's, what's your criteria or standard you're using to judge its truth? What we need, Sexus Empiricus admits, is a starting point, a definitive non-arbitrary justification that requires no further justifications. The Peronian skeptics, such as Sextus Empiricus, unsurprisingly denied there were such starting points. A number of important moves in the history of modern philosophy, including Purses and Deleuze's, can be best understood as responding to this challenge. So that brings me, that's the end of the first section already. So, uh, so on to Purse and Principle of Sufficient Reason. To see how Purse responds to the skeptical challenge, let us begin with the importance of the principle of sufficient reason. As Peirce notes, we often don't seek for the reasons of things, even though we could if so inclined, but we do when novel, unexpected circumstances arise. In his essay, Architecture of Theories, Peirce argues that a pitched coin could a pitched coin should sometimes turn up heads and sometimes tails, calls for no particular explanation. But if it shows heads every time, we wish to know how this result has been brought about. Law is par excellence, the thing that wants a reason. Now, the only possible way of accounting for the laws of nature and for uniformity in general is to, is to suppose them results of evolution. Therefore, this involves an element of indeterminacy, spontaneity, or absolute chance in nature. For Peirce, therefore, what does not need an explanation are the chance events and encounters, but rather the fact that something occurs with predictable regularity, in short, laws. On this point, Peirce would agree with Deleuze, and in particular, with Deleuze's claim that, quote, abstractions explain nothing. They themselves have to be explained. There are no such things as universals. There's nothing transcendent. There are only processes, sometimes unifying, subjectifying, rationalizing, but just processes all the same, end quote. What then would an explanation of an abstraction look like? Or what is the sufficient reason that accounts for the regular, predictable, and law-like? For both Peirce and Deleuze, the answer is the same. Habit is what accounts for the emergence of laws and abstract generalizations. Deleuze is clear on this point, quote from difference and repetition, habit draws something new from repetition, namely difference in the first instance understood as generality. And so is Peirce, and here's Peirce quote from Peirce. I make use of chance chiefly to make room for a principle of generalization or tendency to form habits, which I hold has produced all regularities, end quote. For both Deleuze and Peirce, therefore, the abstract and general, including general laws, is to be accounted for in terms of the tendency to form habits. The nature of this tendency and its relationship to the abstractions, laws, and rules it makes possible will be discussed below. But before doing this, I want to draw on the thoughts of another perhaps surprising ally in our effort to provide the sufficient reason for laws themselves. I want to turn to Spinoza. Turning to Spinoza, now the third section. Uh, turning to Spinoza at this point might at first seem to be an ill-advised move. After all, isn't Spinoza the great proponent of the primacy of laws and of the lawful necessity whereby everything that is or happens is determined? This is true in part, but depends on how we interpret Spinoza's claim, and this is the key claim from the ethics. From the necessity of the divine nature, there must follow infinitely many things in infinitely many modes, okay? 
It is frequently assumed that the way things follow from the necessity of the divine nature is in accordance with a law of nature, a law or rule that predetermines and necessarily so all that has and will happen in accordance with this law. So if we were supercomputer smart and knew all the laws and everything, we could just simply know everything that will happen in, in the future. On this reading of what Spinoza means by uh, necessitarianism. If this is how Spinoza understands the way something follows with the same necessity from the nature of God, which he doesn't, I argue, then Spinoza could fall prey to the skeptical challenge Wittgenstein posed with his famous rule following paradox. This was the paradox to summarize briefly, that in order to know whether or not we are following the correct rule with respect to any new case, we need a way of knowing that it is indeed this rule and not another rule that applies to this novel case. But this way of knowing will itself involve a rule which may or may not be the right one to use in this case and so on. Clarifying briefly how Spinoza avoids the consequences, these consequences, these skeptical consequences, will enable us to better understand the relationship between chance, the fortuitous, and the generalizations and laws that result through the formation of habits. What I argue in another paper, and perhaps we can turn to this in the discussion, is that substance, according to Spinoza, is properly understood as the absolutely infinite and indeterminate problem <clears throat> and is not to be confused with any determinate substance. So that's also in the forthcoming book where I develop a lot of these ideas as well. <clears throat> so it's not to be confused with any determinate substance that is mode, nor with any determinate rules, laws, and abstractions. To understand how substance as problem allows us to account for the abstract we can, turn to, we can turn to Deleuze's difference in repetition. And the important example he gives there of a process that he, he thinks does explain the abstract in general. That is the process of learning. So at this point, I've skipped over a discussion of Spinoza where I see Spinoza and Deleuze very much working along similar lines about understanding the nature of substance as, as problem. Um, I want to focus on this notion of learning because I think that helps clarify the issue. Where do rules come from? If they aren't primary, where do they come from? Then? Which is the question that, that first asked, right? If, if rules aren't primary, if they're the result of habit, what is habit then? How does habit create rules? Um, and learning, I think, is a concept that Deleuze develops writ large as a way of, of, of explaining that. Uh, Deleuze does this by way, this clarifies learning, by way of the example of a well-known test in psychology that involves a monkey who is supposed to find food in boxes of one particular color amidst others of various colors. That was a quote. As we might imagine, a hungry monkey may by chance stumble upon food under a box and then begin to search for food under the remaining boxes, regardless of their color. So now there's a, a chance fortuitous encounter with food it gets them all excited. So they start looking randomly for food. At some point, however, and as Deleuze continues, quote, there comes a paradoxical period during which the number of errors diminishes, even though the monkey does not yet possess the knowledge or truth of a solution in each case, end quote. Deleuze will refer to this paradoxical period as the objecticity of a problem or idea, whereby the elements that constitute the problem are drawn together. For instance, the boxes with their varied colors, food, the fact that they're hungry, etc., cetera, uh, brings all these things together in a way that allows for the solution to appear, a solution that then enables the monkey to know that the food is under boxes of one particular color. Now, without making too much of of this example, we use one from experience of learning to drive a stick shift car, which is more common here in Italy, I've realized, than, than it is in the States. It's almost impossible to get a stick shift in the States, but you have the clutch, the gas, the, uh, the brake, the stick shift. So if you'll recall learning, you have those various elements. And if you don't bring them together in the right way, you stall, you jerk along and so on. But but when you first get behind the wheel of the car, you have no idea what to do. What you have to do is bring them together into a problematic state 
but that problematic state is still not the skill yet. When it becomes a skill, it becomes rule-like. You don't even think about it at that point, right? That's when it becomes a full-fledged habit. Uh, that's when it becomes something you do automatically. During the learning process is the time when the elements need to be brought together to form the habit or the rule or uh, the expectation that we then act in accordance with. It's easy to explain the rule to someone who doesn't know how to drive a stick shift car, but it's a much different thing to learn to drive a stick shift car, even though the rule is correct. Uh, when you stay, just list, release the clutch while you push on the gas and then you're ready to go. It's, as you probably know, it's much harder than that. Um, okay, this process of encountering a problem is precisely how Deleuze understands learning. Quote, learning is the appropriate name for the subjective acts carried out when one is confronted with the objecticity of a problem idea whereas knowledge designates only the generality of concepts or the calm possession of a rule enabling solutions, end quote. Moreover, the determinate solutions that result from the process of learning do, do not exhaust the nature of a problem, a nature that is infinite and indeterminate. When a child learns to tie their shoes, to take another simple example, they confront the problem of arranging and tying the laces of their shoes such that among other things, one, the laces remain tied together and do not unravel. Two, the shoes are tightened and don't fall off. And three, the laces can be easily untied. As anyone who has watched several children who have recently learned to tie their shoes will know, there are multiple solutions to this problem or the solution a particular child comes to does not exhaust the problem. It is this process of learning that Deleuze claims accounts for the abstractions and rules we come to follow and employ when we possess knowledge. So returning to Spinoza's claim, that quote that's on the PowerPoint slide, from the necessity of the divine nature, there must follow infinitely many things, in infinitely many modes, Spinoza avoids the skeptical challenge of rule following, Wittgenstein's skeptical challenge, because what it means to follow from the divine nature is that solutions follow from the nature of substance as a problem. Understood in this way, substance is not a rule which determines in advance the manner in which things occur. Rather, it is substance that makes possible the rules and laws that serve as the solutions the problem makes possible. With this Deleuzean interpretation of substance as problem, we can begin to see how Deleuze reconciles the philosophies of Spinoza and Hume. Philosophies that are often thought to be at odds, if not mutually exclusive, the empiricist versus the rationalist, right? Um, where it is assumed that rationalism presupposes the reality of rules and laws that predetermine the manner in which the given is given. And empiricism, by contrast, claims that rules are merely inductive inferences based on the given, rules that are not predetermined and may well change. On Deleuze's reading, the given, as determinately given, is made possible by difference or by problems. Deleuze is clear in this point, quote, diversity is given, but difference is that by which the given is given, that by which the given is given as diverse, end quote. With this, we return to our earlier claim regarding habit. Namely, Deleuze's claim that habit draws something new from repetition, namely difference, in the first instance understood as generality. Let us now turn to clarify the manner in which habit draws something from repetition. For this will not only clarify Deleuze's understanding of the principle of sufficient reason, but it will also show how Peirce thinks that the laws of nature themselves are made possible by a cosmological tendency to habit formation. So on to the fourth section, contemplation, habit, and inorganic life. The importance of habit for Deleuze emerges early in difference and repetition, when in the second chapter, Deleuze builds upon Hume's arguments. Following Hume, Deleuze notes that unseeing B follow A repeatedly, there comes a time when unseeing A, one expects B. What has changed and what accounts for the change that brings about this expectation? As Deleuze argues, and he is simply reiterating Hume on this point, nothing in A 
has changed to create the expectation of B. The repetition of A changes nothing in the object repeated Deleuze claims, but this repetition does change something in the mind which contemplates it. In a process Deleuze will call passive synthesis, what occurs in the process of contemplation, whereby the mind contemplates the repetition of B following A, is that the elements A and B come to be contracted. Think about the example of driving a stick shift car, so the elements can be brought together in a way. Um, and it is this contraction of elements that comes to be expressed as a habit, a habit of expectation, for instance. It is this process of habit formation that becomes the basis upon which Deleuze will understand organic life, and it is also key to his understanding of inorganic life. To clarify the importance of inorganic life for Deleuze, it is essential first to note that the process of contraction that comes with contemplation is not itself an action. Okay, contemplation is not an action. Okay. Deleuze is quite clear on this point. Quote, when we say that habit is a contraction, we are speaking not of an instantaneous action, which combines with another to form an element of repetition, but rather the fusion of that element in the contemplating mind." End quote. In short, the contemplating mind is not an active subject, a subject engaged in the processes of life, wherein it combines one element with another, for instance, but rather a soul or element that is irreducible to organic processes, while at the same time being the condition that makes them possible. Stated in the terms used earlier, the contraction that comes with contemplation is precisely what draws the elements together so that they become a problem or idea, which then makes possible the solution or rule that one can then use to predetermine and guide an action. In this case, the elements repeated are drawn together, contracted, and it is this contraction that makes possible the habit, that is the expectation that B will follow A. It is for this reason that Deleuze immediately adds where my previous quote ended, the following claim. A soul must be attributed to the heart, to the muscles, nerves, and cells, but a contemplative soul whose entire function is to contract a habit. This soul is not an active body, an assemblage of excitation response processes, which is how they often occur of organic life in terms of that type of excitation response. Um, rather, it is the contemplation of the soul that allows for the possibility of the habits that are these excitation responses. For Deleuze, therefore, the life of organisms is made possible by contemplation. So in other words, rather than contemplation being an expression of life, it's in Deleuze's reading, that which makes life itself possible. Which leads to the next quote. For Deleuze, therefore, the life of organisms is made possible by contemplation. Quote, what organism is not made of elements and cases of repetition of contemplated and contracted water, nitrogen, carbon, chlorides, and sulfates? thereby intertwining all the habits of which it is composed. Deleuze then follows this claim with the bold statement, organisms awake to the sublime words of the third Aeneid, all is contemplation. That's from Plotinus. It is important, however, to distinguish contemplation from habit. One is not to be confused or conflated with the other. Deleuze is forthright on this, quote, it is simultaneously through contraction that we are habits, but through contemplation that we contract, which Deleuze repeats years later in what is philosophy. Quote, it is through contemplation that one contracts, contemplating oneself to the extent that one contemplates the elements from which one originates, and originates as the intertwining of all the habits of which one is composed. Stated again in terms used earlier, Contemplation is the contraction of elements into a problematic or idea. And it is the problematic that makes possible the solutions that do not exhaust the problematic. Solutions that are the determinate phenomena 
such as the sensory motor habits of organisms, or even the determinate habits of inorganic elements, such as sodium chloride, etc., or the laws of nature, as Peirce understands it. And now that brings me back to Peirce in the final uh, section um, for today's paper. So returning to Peirce at this point, it might seem at first that Peirce has no conception of inorganic life or of contemplations and contractions that are not those of living things. When Peirce, for example, admits, quote, pure spontaneity or life as a character of the universe, oh wait, pure spontaneity or life as a character of the universe, I, Peirce, account for all the variety and diversity of the universe in the only sense in which the really sui generis and new can be said to be accounted for. Now, when Peirce says that, it appears that he is not differentiating between organic and inorganic life. All simply is life. Peirce thus might not accept Luzon Guattari's claim that, quote, not all life is organic, but everywhere there are forces that constitute microbrains or an inorganic life of things, end quote. By microbrains, Deleuze and Guattari have in mind what Deleuze referred to in difference and repetition as the soul or mind that contemplates. Similarly, in this context, microbrains contract elements into a problem or idea, and it is this that makes possible all regularities and generalities, whether organic or not. On this point, moreover, Peirce anticipates Deleuze and Guattari's move, or he too would acknowledge an inorganic life of things in Deleuze and Guattari's sense of the term. For Peirce, this inorganic life of things is simply the tendency for things to emerge as the habits of the cosmos. As Peirce puts it, almost, um, as Peirce puts it, quote, it is, and that the quote will come in a second, as it is clear that there is nothing but a principle of habit, itself due to the growth by habit of an infinitesimal chance tendency toward habit taking. And it is the only bridge that can span the chasm between the chance medley of chaos and the cosmos of order and law, end quote. It is at this point where the principle of sufficient reason becomes crucial to Peirce's project and where we can see how Peirce overcomes the skeptical challenge. Let us begin with an early essay, Peirce's 1868, Questions Concerning Certain Faculties Claimed for Man which was one of a series of articles for the Journal of Speculative Philosophy, also known as the Cognition Series by Peirce scholars. In this essay, Peirce will highlight a number of incapacities that philosophers had traditionally taken to be capacities. For my purposes today, I will focus on the first supposed capacity, our ability to distinguish between an intuition that is a primitive, unquestioned given, that is not determined by any previous thoughts or cognitions, such as past experiences, education, habituation, et cetera, and the cognition that always is, according to Peirce, determined by previous cognitions. An intuition on this view serves as the premise upon which a chain of thoughts and cognitions can be founded, or it can serve as the starting point Sextus Empiricus claimed was necessary to avoid the regressus ad infinitum. As Peirce points out, many would like to believe they can or have the capacity to accurately distinguish between premises, intuitions, and the arguments that are grounded upon them. For Peirce, however, this is not a capacity we have. Peirce offers the example of the 11th century theologian Berengarius to make this point. Berengarius had the audacity to suggest that, quote, the authoritativeness of any particular authority must rest upon reason, end quote. Berengarius's contemporaries thought such a suggestion was absurd and impious. The, quote, credibility of authority, Peirce points out, was regarded by men of that time simply as an ultimate premise, as a cognition not determined by a previous cognition of the same object, or in our terms, as an intuition, end quote. The lesson first draws from this example is that what we take to be intuitive today, such as the data of sense intuition, or what Peirce will call internal authority, may tomorrow come to be seen as cognitions rather than intuitions. 
first anticipating Wil Wilfred Sellers' myth of the given arguments here. Peirce thus asks rhetorically, quote, now what if our internal authority should meet the same fate in the history of opinions as that external authority has met, end quote. The next question for Peirce is whether it is even possible for there to be an intuition at all or whether all cognitions are determined by other cognitions and so on ad infinitum. In other words, where does Peirce stand with respect to the skeptical challenge? The short answer for Peirce is that there is no starting point, no grounding intuitions. All cognitions are determined by previous cognitions. Rather than resign himself to skepticism with, his, with this claim, Peirce then turns to the principle of sufficient reason. Peirce argues, for instance, that it is problematic to look, quote, for something entirely out of consciousness, which may be supposed to determine it, consciousness, but can as such only be known and only adduced in the determinate cognition in question, end quote. In other words, and in the tradition of Berkeley, to think the condition that is outside all thought and cognition is to think this condition. And hence, we have not made the case for a cognition that is not determined by another cognition. If we persist, however, and argue for a condition that is absolutely external, as Peirce puts it, or a sufficient reason beyond any thought, then such a condition becomes inexplicable. For if an explanation is to be successful, it would entail being recognized and understood as such. In short, it will involve cognition. To, re to rely upon the inexplicable to explain cognition is contradictory. Peirce's conclusion, therefore, is that all cognitions are determined by previous cognitions. So are we left with skepticism, therefore, since every cognition presupposes another cognition, and so on ad infinitum? For Peirce, the answer is no. To clarify, we can refer to two brief examples. In the first, which is again from the 1868 essay, Peirce compares the successive chain of thoughts to an inverted triangle partially submerged in water. The water line on this triangle corresponds to a cognition. And as we move the triangle up and down in the water, we have further cognitions, each one being determined by the movement from the previous one. The triangle, however, does not con contact the water at a point. For every point, Peirce argues, can be further divided, or in this case, each water line can be further subdivided, and yet there is the triangle. We haven't undone the triangle. For Peirce, then, on the traditional assumptions that motivate the skeptical challenge, either we have determinate cognitions, water lines on the triangle, or the triangle is out of the water and we have no cognitions at all. The skeptical challenge emerges at least in the form we have been discussing today, as one seeks to determine whether the cognition is or is not in a version of Zeno's paradox that leaves us without a definitive determinate starting point. For Peirce, however, and this is the point of his use of the analogy of the triangle, the triangle itself is simply the infinite continuum and is not to be confused with the various ways we determinately subdivide it into points and segments or cognitions. This point becomes clearer in the second example, which comes from Peirce's late essay, Cynicism, Fallibilism, and Evolution. And this example does not rely upon an analogy. In this essay, Peirce short circuits the skeptical challenge from the start by rejecting the exclusive disjunction between existence and non-existence. And he argues instead that There we go. Quote, all things are continuous and that the universe must be undergoing continuous growth from non-existence to existence. There is no difficulty in conceiving existence as a matter of degree. <clears throat> there is thus for Peirce, no determinate fixed points of existence. Reality itself is simply the process of becoming more and more existent. Even the laws of nature to return to our earlier discussion, quote, our results of evolution that underlying all other laws is the only tendency which can grow by its own virtue, the tendency of all things to take habits. Anyway, 
It is this tendency to take habits, this continual process of settling into habits, that is, for first, the principle of sufficient reason for all that appears, for all determinate particular phenomena. For Peirce, then, the infinite is not something that forces one into skepticism, but rather it is the infinite or an infinite continuum that is the sufficient reason for the finite and determinate that is. And the infinite continuum is not to be confused or conflated with the determinate and existent. To detail Peirce's entire arguments regarding continuity would take us too far afield. But in concluding, we can see how Peirce does indeed anticipate Deleuze's own Spinozist arguments for an absolutely infinite substance that is fundamentally problematic in nature. To connect Peirce to Deleuze's arguments regarding problematic ideas that are irreducible to the determinate solutions they make possible, we can refer to one last example that Peirce offers. A blackboard, Peirce suggests, can be seen to be, quote, a continuum of two dimensions. Well, that which it stands for is a continuum of some indefinite multitude of dimensions. This is from the logic of things, logic and habit of things lectures that were very late lectures for, for Peirce. The blackboard thus stands for the infinite continuum that is reality itself, or for the chaos and continuity upon which the generalizing habit-taking tendency of reality relies. To this blackboard, Peirce draws a chalk line, thereby introducing a discontinuity, which he claims, quote, is one of those brute acts by which alone the vagueness could have made a step toward definiteness, end quote. The chalk line, however, is its own continuity. And so the discontinuity that, uh, that emerges involves two continuities. Peirce is clear on this point, quote, the only line that is there is the line which forms the limit between the black surface and the white surface. Thus, discontinuity can only be produced upon that blackboard by the reaction between two continuous surfaces into which it is separated, the white surface and the black surface, end quote. Stated in Deleuze's terms, and as discussed earlier, everything that is given and determinate presupposes a problematic idea that is infinite and indeterminate. So the determinate discontinuous line is what it is in virtue of the blackboard. And yet this line itself involves its own continuity or problematic idea. And thus it too can be the sufficient reason for further determinations and so on. As Peirce continues his example, once a mark on the chalkboard gets to the point where it will stay for a little while, then as Peirce concludes, we have, quote, some beginning of a habit that has been established by virtue of which the accident acquires some incipient staying quality, some tendency toward consistency, end quote. In short, for Peirce, each determinate identity, each thing, is itself the result of a habit-taking tendency. And these determinate identities may in turn be taken up by yet other habit-taking tendencies, and so on. Even the laws of nature, as we have seen, presuppose a habit-taking tendency or an infinite substance and problem, to use the terms developed here today, that is not to be confused with any law. Moreover, and in a move that avoids the skeptical challenge of rule following, Peirce concludes that, quote, if the laws of nature are still in process of evolution from a state of things in the infinitely distant past in which there were no laws, it must be that events are not even now absolutely regulated by law, end quote. For Peirce, therefore, and for Deleuze as well, in his Persian form of pragmatism, the task of an experimental philosophy is to be alert precisely for the singularities and events that evade any given laws, but are nonetheless the sufficient reason for the new, for that which does not yet exist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for your paper full of suggestions. And thank you for quoting uh, the passage from the logic of things because I translated it in, <laughs> in the 
in the 80s of the last century. So I, I love it. Well, I'm glad I was able to do that. <laughs> now I give floor to Silvia Zanelli. That she's the discussion. Okay. okay. So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, so I find the relation between continuity and discontinuity in first philosophy very interesting and in a way underrated. So also according to me, there is a profound convergence between Deleuze and Peirce on the topic. And uh, in my opinion, the relation between generality and individuality in Peirce reflected the Deleuzean distinction, but also indiscernibility between the actual and the virtual. So between difference and repetition also. And I think that one of the merits of the Deleuzean thought is to think of such a relationship as a mutual intersection rather, and uh, uh, as a genetic process uh, rather than a, a dichotomy. And, um, and I think this is also first effort in a way, also not, not that explicitly as it is in Deleuze. Uh, so Deleuze imagined this in intersectionality between uh, the actual and the virtual uh, and uh, he imagined that as a fishing net that uh, as not to be too wide and too large to catch fish. And uh, in similar way, first, for first, thirdness without secondness is just a judge without serifs. So I feel that there is a strong convergence on this topic. And ultimately, both for Peirce and Deleuze, I think that transcendence makes no sense as uh, immanence for both are, is in itself, as it, it is self-sufficient. Uh, I also really like uh, William James' image according to which experience is like a, a mosaic that is held together by its pieces and uh, where there is nothing beyond this mosaic of experience that makes this in interconnection possible. So I think that transcendence both in Peirce and Deleuze make no sense at all. And also a core point of your presentation was about uh, a possible way of escaping, escaping this skeptical challenge of the regressed infinitum. And this can be done according to you, uh, thanks, to, thanks to the radical openness of, of immanence in Deleuze on the one hand, and thanks to the semiosis process in person on the other hand, um, that are according to you uh, a principle of sufficient reason. And uh, I totally agree with you on that, uh, as I find a strong uh, resemblance between first pragmaticism and the less problematicism. Uh, but I wonder, and this is my fundamentally first question, uh, if their conclusion coincides in a way as they both develop a reticular and open image of immanence, but not their premises. Uh, as I think there is a, a little difference in their way of conceptualizing the notion of habit. Uh, in fact, it seems to me that in Peirce, the notion of habit is more radical than in Deleuze, and that Deleuze wants to overcome, in a way, the, the concept of habit in difference and repetition, where he conceptualizes the first synthesis of time. As according to him, habit presupposes, in a way, a certain linear vision of time, uh, where the present has a, the preeminence uh, on the future and the past. So I feel that while in first habit is the sort of uh, dispositive of generality to follow a Foucaultian account, in Deleuze, uh, according to me, is just pure actuality. Uh, so I think that the notion of habit in Deleuze is still empirical in the human sense, closer to the notion of custom rather than transcendentally empirical or radically empirical. So I wanted to hear a little bit about it. And I also have a broader question, a question on the notion of problem and problematicism that strikes me most as is uh, the, the key point of my dissertation. Um, so do you think that the semiosis process can be understood as a problematic one and that uh, it, it, we can use the notion of problem uh, to explain Peirce and the semiosis process in, in a Deleuzean sense, as semiosis is a serial, a relational, and concatenated process. And also, I think that Deleuze has a rough idea of sign is its production, and uh, it has not developed it that, that much and it, in its profoundness. Um, so do you, do you agree that uh, immanence that does not imply directly a semiotic approach for Deleuze? But uh, conversely, that the semiosis process uh, that Peirce proposes can be seen as an imminent one. Yeah, these are basically my questions. Okay, thank you. Very good, good questions. I, um, so 
I got three down, and then you can correct me if I uh, <laughs> sure. if I didn't get them down. Um, here's the first question um, about habit. I think you're right. I think um, habit is definitely, especially in the logic things, and some of the quotes that I had in my talk is like the overarching process, cosmo cosmological process for purse. And um, for, for Deleuze, which is very typical of Deleuze, he starts with habit because it's kind of a Humean notion that he, he starts with. Um, but then he, he, I think Deleuze is more interested in what accounts for the new as opposed to how abstractions come to be, right? So, um, and in order to do that, I think you have to break habits at some point. And I think that's, I think there is a little bit of, of that difference between the lose. And I think that's where learning comes in because if you think about learning, part of learning entails breaking habits. There's an unlearning that is involved with learning. Deleuze gives the example of learning to swim in difference and repetition. And he says, there's something very, uh, there's not, I can't remember the exact word. Not, I don't wanna say, there's a fatality to learning or a dangerousness to learning because to truly learn, one needs to unlearn one's established habits, expectations um, and encounter the problem. And, and that opens the door for a new habit. So I, I would emphasize learning more than habit. And I see that as a, in my book on what is philosophy, when I, just, I argue that that's really what they're doing, what is philosophy. They, as I say at the end of the introduction, they're doing a pedagogy of the concept in what is philosophy. And I, and I think that they're creating a concept of life as learning with three main components, science, art, and philosophy. Uh, I think that's why they divide the book in, in that way. So I do think pedagogy or learning is probably more important than, than habit. But at least in difference repetition, I do think habit verges close to what I think first was trying to do with it. So I think you are right to, to stress the, the difference there. Your second question on problems. So I'll be interested to hear more about <clears throat> your dissertation if you're writing on problems. Um, is the extent to which, yes, I agree. I think problems for both Purse and, and uh, Deleuze are imminent since there's definitely no transcendence for, for either of them. Um, now Deleuze and semiotics, as you probably know, Deleuze most engages with Purse's semiotics in his cinema books. Uh, and um, I didn't bring that in because I would have made the paper much, much longer than it already was. But I would say that there is, if we think about contemplation, uh, there is an externality of relations that's comparable to thirdness, right? Because as uh, following Hume, when A follows B, it, there's nothing in A or B that accounts for the expectation of B following A. It's the contemplation, which is a form of relation external, as, as Deleuze will say in a number of cases, relations are external to their terms. Um, and so there is a kind of thirdness in Deleuze's understanding of contemplation. And that is a concept that sticks with Deleuze throughout, there's a number of changes in Deleuze's writings from difference in reputation up to his late writings. But contemplation is one of those terms that actually sticks around during a lot of the, the writing. So I, I think that could be developed more into a type of semiotics along Peirce's lines. And you could also um, develop, I think, the concept of inorganic life that I was developing today as well, because one of the things in the cinema books in particular, the sensory motor image of the first cinema book gets broken and that's where the time image comes in. The time image creates sort of the inorganic conditions that even make life itself possible. So I didn't do that here and that would be a whole other project, but I do think that is a project that, that could be um, developed. 
And what was your third question? I have just written, I just wrote imminence down, but yeah. I think there was more to it than that. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a, a sort of asymmetrical uh, relationality between Peirce and Deleuze, because I think that Peirce uh, is not that profound in, uh, Deleuze is not that profound in talking about sign in Peirce, but that I feel that the, they have a, a strong uh, resemblance on the notion of ontology rather than semiotics, yeah. on the modes of beings, the virtuality yeah. corresponding to generality and thirdness and secondness can be seen as individuality in the list. So I think they they are closer in on, from an ontological point of view rather than from a semiotical one. And I wonder if you agree. <laughs> yeah, there is um, the one aspect of Deleuze's work where signs come in is when they talk about uh, all is a signal sign system, right? There's a kind of, where if you think of a signal as being uh, and a good example of, of that would be bird calls, bird songs. Uh, a bird that has established a territory will have a song that signals to other birds that this is their territory, right? So there's potential aggression that may happen if a bird wanders in. But um, that's an already established signal that crosses two already established territories or a territory and non-territory, whereas signs in this way of thinking about it are what are brought together as a bird learns or establishes a territory, right? There's not a lot of studies on birds going into a territory, but when they go into a territory, they're picking up on all the bird songs in the, in the surrounding area. And those become signs as part of their learning process, which they then, bring together and it becomes actualized as once they establish a territory, their bird song. Um, so, so there is, and, and I just talked about territorial behavior of birds, but, but I think Deleuze implies that it's, him and he says, all is a signal sign system. So in some way or form, there is a kind of, as I would put it, relationship between a problem and solutions uh, throughout, reality, the nature of reality, that's where the Spinozist stuff comes in. Substance, reality is ultimately problematic. So uh, natura naturans is problematic. Natura naturata is solutions. Um, so I think, yes, you could develop a semiotics if you, if you went in that direction. But you're right, he doesn't develop nearly to the degree that that person does. And I think part of that is that Deleuze was was somewhat wary of logic and, and, and yeah, getting sure. caught up in logic. Hearst loved logic. He was very good at it too. Uh, and so uh, he had no worries about getting into the weeds of logical distinctions and so on and so forth. Whereas Deleuze is a little more wary, I think, as a philosopher of, of, of doing that. Yeah, I also think that the notion of problem is really important to all, can, and can be really important also for pragmatism. Because yeah. it really, it's really a pragmatistic uh, notion in a yeah. way. No, you're right, it is. And it's really underrated here in Italy in the Deleuzean studies, the notion of problem. I, I don't know why, but it is. <laughs> so. Well, good. Well, you're fixing that. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Uh, I, if there are some questions, uh, maybe we can begin with Maria Regina. Okay, so thank you a lot. I have many questions, okay. but maybe we start to, to one. Um, because you quote, I mean, you quote different uh, repetition and said that, that habit draws something new from repetition different. Um, so could you explain a little more the, what does it mean? Because uh, I mean, I have some problems, I guess, as anyone with difference and repetition. But um, because uh, I mean, I study especially PERS. So um, as also Sylvia said a while ago, uh, there is this tension in between continuity and discontinuity. And if I, I look at Peirce, he has at least two strategies. I mean, for, I mean, almost everywhere he says that there is evolution and we need chance in order to explain evolution. And that, so we need a chance in order to explain law. 
But then uh, in 1893, in evolutionary law, he uh, displays three different kinds of evolution. And so, and he criticizes Darwinian type of evolution because uh, chance is not primarily according to him. I mean, we need chance, but continuity comes first, as you said. So, uh, and he calls it evolutionary love, et cetera. And, and in, it's inter very interesting, according to me, that in that essay, he talks about a new kind of novelty uh, of new things that emerge from this continuity of love, according to him. So in that essay, at least there is another way of explaining continuity that is not limited to chance, but to habit. So when I read this uh, quote, that habit draws something new from repetition, I was clear about, uh, I don't know, is something like that. I mean, is Deleuze implying that from habit, that something new really appear or what he is, what he is saying here, I, I'm not sure about that. Or just um, to, to clarify a little bit, it seems to me, that, as you said now in discussion, that of course, at a certain point for Deleuze, we need to break expectation, we need to break habits. So it's not clear to me whether, um, let's say, novelty is really opposed to habit, or there can be like a profound connection um so that we can see novelty as really happening through habits okay. yeah i mean I, I i hear what you're you're saying and when i first I came across that quote <clears throat> years ago i think i had probably a similar reaction that's like what how can habit be something new right isn't that habit seems to be by almost definition repeating the same uh again and again but I think um, we go back to, to, to the process, and this is kind of what, what Hume is saying in, in the treatise, what Hume argues is that the idea of necessary connection is something that humans brought to the table. It's something new, a new idea that, that humans came up because of the association of ideas and so on and so forth. So what, what Deleuze does with that is that if we think of, the generality that emerges from habit, it is new simply because it's not reducible to the elements themselves, right? You can't reduce it to the elements that were repeated. Um, and so it is something new. It's, I guess you could say it's an emergent property to, to use a more contemporary term. It wasn't a term that Deleuze uses very often or it's not one that Hume, of course, knew either, but it is a term I think captures part of what they're doing. So that as an emergent property, it is something new. And it's not eternal, right? This is where that the imminence again, none of these, in the traditional philosophy, emergent properties would have been equated with rules or essences or forms. Um, whereas instead, they're kind of an emergent property that results as a, as a, as a consequence of a problem becoming resolved as a habit. Um, and yet no habit is eternal or, or everlasting. It will, it's, it, the problem is always inseparable from a habit. And so it may well uh, become undone and give rise to new habits. Uh, so I think that's the way in which um, habit creates something new for, for Deleuze. I don't know if that helps with the... Uh, yeah. 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 So I have a collateral question, which, um, but that it also is both collateral and quite central, I feel. Um, one thing that it's not clear to me is the relationship between uh, the first quote you used from Mark Fisher and inorganic life. Okay. I ask you this mostly because I feel that my own interest in pragmatism is kind of came also from a, an indirect influence of Mark Fisher upon my own work so there's firstly this sort of personal interest of mm -hmm. how do you think these two things relate and on the other hand because i believe that paradoxically enough mark fisher had a quite similar genealogy to the one you laid out thus far so his interest when he had to give a productive answer to there must be an end to capitalism rather than the end of the world right. came a lot from a study of spinoza and spinoza's rationalism and also, of course, an interest in French theory. Right. 
without, of course, the pragmatism, which I don't think he was very much interested in. But I was really fascinated by both the sort of shared genealogy and, and, and I wanted to probe how you would relate uh, in organic life and, for example, habit and novelty to the question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you brought up that question because that was obviously not something I could have explored here without making the talk so much longer. Um, I th one of the things I do in my my uh, critical existentialism book that's coming out is I develop that a theory of narratives. And so now that you've heard the, the talk today, basically my understanding of narratives I developed there is, is it's a kind of problematic state that helps us make sense of our lives, right? So it's, it's, it's a kind of solution uh, that provides us with a uh, sort of template, so to speak, that we then br bring with us often unconsciously to make sense of uh, and interpret the world, but it always has a problem and separate from it. So what ideology critique, and I have an essay that came out recently in Deleuze and, and Althusser, where I talk about the understanding of ideology and ideology critique is that ideology in this negative form appears as a solution without a problem. So part of what I would do, and I haven't done this as part of my, what I'm thinking about now, is that, that nationalism is a form of storytelling, right? If we think about the rise of nationalism, it, it ties with a national story, with history, historia. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, it's deeply rooted in this. It's a sense of shared, of Benedict Anderson, his book, Imagined Communities, where he talks about how there's a sense, those imagined communities are often through stories, through narratives that, constructed a kind of sense of identity. Uh, and so the, the way to challenge the sort of break out of the circle is to think that these narratives are not unproblematic, right? They aren't essences, they aren't. Uh, and, and that's kind of what Althusser tries to do with making space for the coincidence or the chances or for the fortuitous, his aleatory metaphysics that Althusser uh, develops and there's a lot in purse where he, the stress and the fortuitous, the aleatory, the chance. Uh, so I think there's some potential interplay there between purse and, and 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 that. So I think that that line of thought, if it's developed more fully, could could help explain why nationalism is such a rigid, uh, emotionally invested concept for many people and how capitalism itself kind of emerged with modern nation states in, in many ways. And so, and capitalism often is, emerges as well as its laws of nature. I right? don't mess with capitalism because markets are self-determining. They have their own laws. We ought not to interfere. Uh, and, and so there's a kind of sense that, that they've kind of come to the role of nation states is to protect capitalism. And they both have this sort of identity that we, we, we cling to. Um, so I think that's the, you have to break that cycle some way. And so I'm kind of, inorganic life is just one little entry to, to begin a process that clearly it's a big, big task, right? To, to think. But if you look historically, I don't know if anyone's read the, the recent David Graeber and David Wengro book, The Dawn of Everything. One of the things they argue in that book is, if you look at much of human history prior to the last few hundred years, we were much more creative in our social uh, lives and um, much more willing to change and, and, and venture into different setups. So I, I think works like that and others are, are providing more fuel to rethinking some of these issues and, and hopefully to a healthier future, if you might. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Yeah. He's, he's working on a PhD dissertation on the habit in person. So. Infatti, yeah, then Zach has said I couldn't work so much on uh, Deleuze uh, in my work for some reason, but at the same time, Deleuze perfectly succeed in getting the main point that you underline so good. So, that, because the problem is this huge gap between the generality of rules, habit, and other stuff, and individuality of 
the uh, instance detection thoughts that we face in every moment and every stage. And, and the first point that I really appreciate is that uh, you underline the point in the sense that uh, these individual instances or the solution we um, give to some problems or the way we follow the rules absolutely cannot satisfy, satisfy or fulfill the generality of that rules of that uh, problem, so the problem situations and habits, of course, and processes that start with the same stuff. So the less perfectly get this stuff. Uh, on the other side, there is the problem in the sense that we can face only this stuff. And it was also my problem in the series, in the, my work, in the sense that it's the some given thoughts that are given to, uh, to us, in the sense that those are external for press. So this kind of given thoughts individual are given to us in some precise moment, in some precise moment, uh, we follow the rule in some way. And of course, so we never achieve the generality of. And so, yeah, the question was since uh, it was also the a kind of final question also in my works in the sense where what can we do with this stuff? In the sense that we have to, we have to try in a critical way or following some other epistemological way, we have to try absolutely to achieve uh, to understand in some way this kind of generality or it's impossible for us and so at the same time what can we do with this uh, given individual stuff if they are so different ontologically from this general stuff they are useful they are a starting point or, or not yeah that's some great great points sounds like you're doing a lot of good work going on here in milan but, uh, um the I mean, I think one of the things that I argue in my the critical existentialism book that's coming out is one of the things that we can do is the I kind of extend the sort of the good faith, bad faith distinction that, that Sartre brings up. Um, and I got into philosophy through existentialism, and I've always still found, found existentialism has an appeal to me. And, and even for Deleuze, I think he was drawn towards Sartre, especially the transcendental field and, and imminence. I mean, he, he really uh, liked a lot of things, especially from the transcendence of the ego and so on. So what I argue is that one way to, is to, to challenge narratives is to find when we have a negative knee-jerk reaction, that's often a, a hint that our narrative is being challenged. Um, I think this is, what, this is what I think Nietzsche was doing when, when Nietzsche gave those chapter titles to Eka Homo, why I am so wise, why I write such good books, why I am so clever, why I am destiny. Um, I think people's natural reaction when they read those, hear those chapter titles is probably negative. Right? He's so full of himself. He's, uh, and, and, so, and, and I think that's exactly the point that the point for Nietzsche is that, that we don't think about our values. We don't think about the narratives that guide our lives or help make sense of our lives until they are confronted, until we have an encounter that problematizes it. And so an initial reaction to that problematizing encounter is to dismiss the source of the encounter. So dismiss Nietzsche here as just being an uh, egomaniac, uh, when in reality, what he's saying is that slave morality, where we deny ourselves and put our will aside to the will of another is the dominant morality. And anyone who is strong-willed uh, is negative or bad. And his chapter titles are, are exemplifying that. So I think that's an, that there is an example right now of how you can go out and, and experiment with challenging some of the narratives that, that we live with today. I mean, you, you have to be careful, as even Deleuze and Guattari say, they, I think they use the phrase cautious experimentalism, right? Because you can, you don't want to go too far too quickly because we need some stability as well. Uh, so I think it's not all problematic and it's not all set in stone solutions either. We, we live in the mixture of, of both tendencies. Hello. We can give word to Professor Leah Friedman okay. and we can hear you if you can uh, ask your question directly. 
Uh, I've written down, but first let me say thank you. Thank you for a very interesting paper uh, and the connections that you've made between Deleuze and, and peers. But I'm, I wanna go back to your first point about uh, capitalism and why we can't think about ending it at all. And it connects to the very notion of habit. And so my question was, given what you've said regarding habit and learning, how then are we capable of ever changing a law, a habit uh, and so forth? How can we, what do we need to do if we are to overcome this determination that capitalism enforces itself upon us and we have no way of fighting it? So I'm just wondering about changing habits. And again, thank you. Yeah, I mean, obviously that's, that's the, the big question, right? How do we uh, do that? And um, I suppose if I had the quick ready answer to that, I would be both a lot of people's best friend and some people's worst enemy. Uh, um, but I do think that, um, I mean, the pandemic has shown to some extent how adjustable and adaptable we are when, when circumstances come in from outside. And, and I think that's part of the organic model is that we are self-sustaining and it's only some disaster or, or, or crisis that causes us to change things. I think one of the habits we can, we can maybe begin to take on is the habit of habit breaking, right? The, the habit of, of thinking outside the box or the habit of, of trying something different um, or being open to different um, sustainable practices. And, and a lot of those habits are just how you set up your home, how you set up your daily life. Uh, you can set that up in a way that, that will become a new habit and, and so on. But that's the idea that have these habits can be, are created, then they become kind of set in, in, in pattern. So I don't know if that's uh, the answer you, you're looking for. I mean, that's, that's one of the things I'm thinking through right now. And I, and, and I think it's something that we all should be thinking through right now as, as we're dealing with climate crisis and, and all those issues in our world, world today. So, if, but thank you for your question. If I may, um try to give my reply. Uh, maybe we have uh, to just to take care of our habit, habits. I mean, recognize them, uh, survive them and, uh, and be, be conscious of what our habits, how they function because we, uh, very often are absolutely uh, unconscious about mm -hmm. uh, our habits and and this is uh, also the, the functioning of habits so to be uh, to be aware of them could be a, a good way to also to take distance uh, in a in a sense if there is a uh, no one else. I have a last uh, question, but uh, I want to leave this room. Um, I want to uh, to hear from you something more on contemplation. Okay. If <clears throat> contemplation, uh, how uh, I I was thinking about the person because uh, uh, my knowledge about the is uh, more poor. <laughs> Uh, in person, uh, intuition, or also contemplation in a in a period, are radically different from inferences and the work of science. Then uh, came a moment in which person uh, was uh, uh, more more conscious of uh, the work of. Uh, um, of, I think, intuition and, and contemplation. Uh, he said in a beautiful passage that uh, 
uh, crystal clearness uh, is the um, is the, the, the merit of second rate mind that the very great minds are those who have the power to seize a question or without uh, going through the, the, the passages of inferences and simiosis to seize upon that is a mm -hmm. of uh, contemplation maybe. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's a, I will admit that notion of contemplation, and I think um, I should read more Plotinus. I have a feeling that would uh, probably help a little bit to kind of get the Plotinian notion of, of how everything sort of emerges from the one. Uh, and, um, but I guess one way of, 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 of thinking about this is, the there's kind of a combination of Spinoza and Leibniz and Plato that kind of and Plotinus that Deleuze is all bringing together, and I think contemplation fulfills kind of the role for for all of them of being the. It's I don't want to use the word place. Actually, I can use Hume. I think this is the example of Hume when when we think of the mind from a Humean perspective. There is no such thing as the mind, right? As a place. Uh, it's not even a stage where impressions and ideas happen, right? It's there are nothing but impressions and then ideas for, from a human perspective. So there is no real kind of place where those have yet a place emerges, right? Uh, that, that whole empiricism and subjectivity book that Deleuze wrote is is on that problem how how for Hume does a sense of self or a mind uh, emerge and that's even a problem for for Nietzsche right how did we come to be the animal that can make promises right? how, how did that come come to pass um, and I think contemplation is sort of the word that accounts for what brings the elements together right and kind of in a self organizing sort of sort of way so it's not contemplation by a mind um and i think that's where the spinozist comes in too the third kind of knowledge is no longer a knowledge between subject and object as you have in the first two kinds of, of, of knowledge for spinoza it becomes basically oneness with god in, in, a, in a way in a weird spinoza sort of sort of way um, so I think that's where where contemplation comes in, but it does um, bear subjective connotations, which uh, I think Deleuze is okay with because he doesn't. One of the tendencies in Deleuze scholarship these days is it has been picked up by science people interested in science. So science has been used a lot explain to lose and i've done so in my philosophy at the edge of chaos book i use dynamic systems theory to help explain a lot of what Deleuze is doing and and i think Deleuze is wary of his work being reduced to a kind of scientism uh in that sort of sense where as i think you put it everything's reduced to the actual and i think if we're going to really accentuate the problematic we need to somehow break from the purely scientific way of, of thinking about things. And I think contemplation as a word does that. So it's kind of more of a, a stylistic, but with an it's with, with the agenda behind it. I agree. I did have one thing I want to add to your, your point about, I think you're right about being aware of our, our habits, because I think that's very important. One of the things I say with, with as an example I'll give with my students is, I mean, We've all probably had conversation with someone where we want them to change. And then they say, that's just the way I am. Uh, and when they say, that's just the way I am, they're basically saying, I can't change. That's, that's my essence. I, that, I, I, that, that my behavior follows with divine necessity from the way I, I am. Um, but if we think of substance or our reality in more of a problematic way, 
it, it doesn't mean we can simply become whatever we want to be, but it also means that there's a little more play with respect to who we are, uh, changes possible. And I, and I do think we have to, I live in Louisiana and we sometimes have bad hurricanes. We had one just last year and life is, is upended for a time. And it's amazing how quickly people adapt to these new, new circumstances. I and mean, I'm sure people in Ukraine right now are adapting to very different circumstances that they weren't expecting six months ago. So uh, we are much more creative than we give ourselves credit for being, I think, very often. And I think that's one of the things that we, did. and I think that's where Peirce and Deleuze come in. They both are interested in creative, the creative process that's at the heart of nature. Uh, if, uh, if there are any other questions from online? Also, on this point, it's very interesting. It's not a question, but just a comment. The fact that when, because this sentence is very important to me when people say I'm just like this, or that it's similar, I want to become like this, uh -huh. in the sense I want to have control or what I become. The problem is not that this sentence, but maybe the idea of self and the like this, yeah. that yeah. to me is not convincing. Because yeah. I don't think that maybe we work like this, you know, because there is this idea of too much strong uh, self and the line uh, uh -huh. and the, behind these uh, sentences. And I think there are quite many examples that show that we are not so, I don't know, square as the right. uh, self. -like. No, I agree. I agree. Thank you very much. Thank you for having for me. This interesting discussion. Thank you to everyone who participated. Bye bye, Elliot. And uh, see you next time in May, in May with uh, Andre Madurier oh. from uh, Paris, uh, from uh, Lyon. Uh, happy to be sure. here in person with you all. Yeah. <laughs>